Só vocês? Só vocês? Ó. Oh. Ei, passou. <risos> Tem bastante gente aqui. Vamos aqui. Tem mais uma camisa. Alguém vai se cadastrar agora? Quem vai se cadastrar agora? Bom, essa eu vou olhar se tá na rede, hein? www.robolivre.org tá? Lembrando que a gente está com concurso aberto. Leve seu robô para a Campus Party. O concurso tá, é, o campeão do concurso vai levar para casa uma impressora 3D. E esse concurso ele é muito simples. A galera aí não está sabendo. Eu vi que teve, tiveram poucas inscrições, menos de mil ainda. Não, te, não, te, não chegamos a mil inscrições para o concurso. E é um concurso massa, porque todo mundo quer ganhar uma impressora 3D. E a galera aí tá cheia dos robôs aí, o cara trouxe o seu Eduino e acha, ah, não, eu não vou me inscrever porque meu robô é fraco. Cara, o concurso Leve Seu Robô para Campus não é robô high-tech com muitas funcionalidades, não. O que está sendo avaliado é a criatividade, se o projeto é aberto e a documentação. Isso que vale ponto. Então, qualquer robôzinho pode ser um, um, até um artefato artístico. Aqueles robôs feitos de massinha, é, o pessoal do Case Mode que faz aqueles robôs ali com o computador dentro. Não é a funcionalidade do robô que está sendo avaliado. Né? Então, agora eu vou chamar agora a última camiseta. Quem vai? Aonde levantar mais gente? Mas essa cara é que tem muito mais gente do que nos outros, né? Onde tem mais gente? E aí, Rodrigo? Onde mais? Lá é? Aqui é? Aqui? É? Olha só! Esse é bom, esse é bom, esse é bom. Pessoal, mais alguns recados. A Olimpíada de Robótica já acabou as inscrições, mas ela está acontecendo. É, quem quiser ver lá na área de workshop, a galera está desenvolvendo seus robozinhos. Quem quiser participar do concurso Leve Seu Robô e usar as ferramentas que a gente está disponibilizando, é só chegar lá na área de workshop também. É... A gente do RoboLive trouxe agora para Campos algumas novidades. A gente vai ter amanhã o pessoal da Queco e o pessoal da Cuca e o pessoal da Festo, que são as duas maiores empresas de robótica industrial do Brasil. Então a gente está trazendo, fazendo um link maior da Campos com as empresas de robótica. Para mostrar que a gente não faz só software no Brasil, não, a gente faz robótica. O César também é uma empresa, um instituto de pesquisa que desenvolve pesquisa na área de Vantes e muitas outras áreas, também está presente aí nessa discussão. Galera, quem aí é da área de computação e quem aí é da área de robótica? Quem aí trabalha na área de robótica? Nossa. Temos uma pessoa. Quem aí trabalha na área de desenvolvimento de software? Boa. Nós somos foda em desenvolvimento de software. O Brasil não deve para ninguém. A gente desenvolve muito melhor que a Índia, que a China e que os Japa. Agora, robótica, a gente está começando. A gente está começando, mas já começaram a aparecer as empresas e as vagas e as oportunidades. Então, gente, vamos se mexer. Aquilo que aconteceu com a computação há 15 anos atrás, está acontecendo com a robótica hoje. E hoje a gente já, já tem oportunidade de trabalhar com robótica no Brasil. Acesse robolive.org, vamos ajudar a divulgar a robótica, mostrar que a robótica é fácil fazer, está presente para todo mundo. Robolive leva a robótica para as crianças de ensino fundamental e médio e também para as universidades e a galera que está empreendendo. Agora o nosso tempo está curto, vou passar para o pessoal do Part Time Science, mais uma atração curada pela Robolive. Obrigado. Headset. Ok, vou ajeitar um headset para a galera. Eu acho que só tem um. Bom, então enquanto o pessoal está tá se ajeitando, é aqui com ele. enquanto o pessoal está se ajeitando ali, eu vou continuar a conversa. Quem de vocês aí é, tem uma ideia de um robô? Já pensou em fazer um robô algum dia? Só teve a ideia, mas nunca construiu. Cara, você pode ganhar um mix leitor D, um e um leitor digital. E uma camisa robô livre. Um novo concurso que acaba de ser lançado. Vai ganhar as duas coisas. São três prêmios, né? Tem primeiro, segundo e terceiro. Vai ganhar uma plaquinha também de desenvolvimento M Cortex. É, um, é uma promoção do robô livre que está sendo lançada agora. Chama Ideia de Robô. Acesse robolivre.org, Ideia de Robô. E dê lá a sua ideia de um robô. É só ideia, não tem que montar, não é em nada. É só a ideia do robô. As três melhores ideias de robô vão ganhar, ser premiadas. A primeira, um leitor, 
o um mix leitor D com uma camiseta, o segundo lugar uma plaquinha Micotex de desenvolvimento e uma camiseta Robô Livre e o terceiro lugar só uma camiseta Robô Livre. É, a divulgação vai ser no sábado, né? Sexta-feira. Sexta-feira a divulgação do concurso. Tá? E o julgamento é feito offline, né? a gente só vai, só vai sair na rede. Tá? Talvez a gente anuncie aqui, mas principalmente na rede. Bom, quem vai se inscrever aí no part-time? Pessoal aí não está ouvindo nada? É isso? Não está ouvindo? Cara, tenta chegar mais para cá, ó. tem cadeiras aqui, é que essa caixa ela é direcional. Eu mesmo não escuto nada que está saindo na caixa, por isso que eu estou falando alto, gritando. Gastando a, voz, a garganta aqui. Então, se chegar mais para cá, eu acho que fica melhor, cara. Bom, além disso, o RoboLive está trazendo para campus também a RoboCup. A RoboCup é o maior evento de competição robótica do mundo, que tem a Copa do Mundo de Futebol de Robôs. Né? E em 2050, ela imagina, ela pensa que vai... O time que, campe... que for campeão da RoboCup vai disputar com o campeão da Copa do Mundo de Humanos em 2050. Será que vai dar isso? Vai dar jogo ou não? Será que dá bola em 2050? Bom, quem não acredita que vai dar bola, no sábado a gente vai estar aqui com o pessoal da UFO, Universidade de Uberlândia, com os robôs humanoides que jogam bola. Uns pequenininhos ainda, ainda tem muito que desenvolver para poder jogar com... A seleção do mundo. A seleção do Brasil, acho que tá, até dá, né? Qualquer um está jogando, mas do mundo ainda vai. Tá, tá meio complicado. Bom, gente, o pessoal está pronto? Vou passar a voz então para Time Science. I don't hear anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hello. What? <laughs> Hello. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas, and over there you will see Res and Claudio, and we three are from the part-time scientists. So uh, today, in this presentation, I will show you what you should consider to. Um, oh, sorry. I have some technical. Issues. <laughs> What? <laughs> hello? Okay, that's working. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Thomas, and over there you see Wesley and Claudio. And we are three are from the part time scientists. So in this presentation, what? <laughs> uh, hmm? Yeah. Okay. So yet now, do you hear me? Okay. Now again. So hello, my name is Thomas, and over there you see Wesley and Claudio, and we three are from the part-time scientists. And in this presentation, uh, we want to show you why you should consider to do rocket science in your hobby.
So yeah, um, as I already called, we are from the part-time scientists. So who we are? We are a team of um, nearly 100 um, scientists, engineers, and developers around the world. Um, we are speaking several languages like English, German, Portuguese, and yeah. So what is our goal, what we want to do? Um, yeah, we try to get a mission uh, to the moon and create hardware, software, and do new science. And yeah. So why we want to go to the moon? At the start, um, there was a Google Lunar, Google Lunar X Prize. It's a competition where you can get uh, 30 million if you arrive the moon surface and take a picture. So that was the uh, start of our uh, team. Yeah, sorry for the technical issues. Um, so, yeah, our mission. So, um, if you uh, consider you want to make a mission, so um, there are four simple steps. The first one is to build something and test it, and the second one is to launch it with a rocket. The third one is um, to land on the surface of your destination, and the fourth one is to explore. Yeah. So, here, if you want to build something, you uh, go into the labor and say, okay, um, I have a rover with four wheels or something like that. Then you uh, say, oh, it's not working on the moon in that way. So, uh, we test something else. So, go into the uh, test chamber, test, go to back to the uh, labor and work, engineering, do some software. So, it's a cycle you do. Then, um, yeah, you look for a rocket, put the hardware in, and you're started. Then landing. So uh, you come onto the uh, surface and try your, your a soft landing or a hard landing. I will explain it later what it is. And last but not least, um, exploring. So you come to the surface, you have your rover, and take some pictures, get some data uh, from the sensors, and put them back to the earth and do something with that. So it sounds uh, really, really easy, but it's not. So in the past, uh, Apollo missions, we know, it's really complicated. There were thousands of engineers and scientists who were working on a single mission uh, around on the world. So now we want to um, get deeper and look into it and um, get where we fit in. So uh, when you want to do uh, something with me, Where's our place here? What can we do? So we go back first to build. Um, yeah, the most problems you have um, in a build session is not to build a, a, a rocket or a, a lander or a rover. The biggest problem are the common problems, the lower problems, like you have an engineer in America and an engineer in Europe. They have to communicate with each other. So yeah. You, find, you have a delay, a shift of hours to, uh, if you want to make a meeting with them. You have to find a way that the one, uh, one in America is away, uh, is arrival uh, at night and the one in European is arrival at the midday. Um, if you spend it uh, over Austria or uh, China, then it's a lot more complicated. So that are the real problems you have in a mission. Um, it's uh, going much, much simpler. For example, where you uh, save your data, or um, how, you, um, yeah, how you review your code, or how you call, uh, talk with each other. Which software you're using, which operating systems. Can the uh, engineer in America uh, use the same software as the engineer in European? Does they understand it? Are they trained for it? So that are the common problems, and they are solvable. It's not. That you have uh, uh, that you need special abilities for it. 
Um, yeah. So on the launch, um, in the past it was really complicated because um, you can only launch a, a, a rocket or a mission um, if it was part of the government. Today it's not the case. Today you have a, a lot of uh, private companies who get you into the space. For example, uh, SpaceX or uh, the Russian uh, with the Russian rocket Nyeper. The Nyeper is a rocket from the Cold War and yeah, it's not used anymore so uh, they use it for space, uh, yeah, space carrying. So you put in your um, rover in the space carrier from uh, the Russian Nyeper and they uh, put you into the uh, void in the space. So you have to imagine, uh, in this rocket uh, will be a CubeSat or uh, several CubeSats and or a rover like uh, we want to uh, get in there. So yeah, today it's possible. You have to pay uh, a lot of money, but uh, compared to the past, it's possible now. And for example, West over there is uh, starting a, a CubeSat in the upcoming year. So yeah, the next stage will be the landing. So um, in the past it was really complicated. There was uh, a lot of um, not successful um, air missions because of uh, they're not knowing the moon surface, they're not knowing the Mars or other planets. So it was really hard to get there because there was a lot of risks. And today it's much easier because uh, there are a lot of missions in the past from the Apollo missions and so on. So we have a lot of data. So we know the density, uh, for example, the rock density of the moon surface around the equator. So it's a lot easier for us to find a place where we can safely land. And in the fourth step, uh, we are exploring. So in the past, it was really complicated to uh, get uh, near hardware like sensors or uh, a communication system. So um, the engineers have to uh, sit down and think about it, like, hmm, what we want to send to, the, uh, for example, the moon. So um, they made a plan, then they made a cost plan, then they said, oh, it's not possible. We can't uh, put this uh, sensor in here because we have to develop it, we have to test it, and then we have to send it up and take a payload and uh, yeah, it rise the price. So today, it's a lot easier because uh, we have many, many circuits, many, many sensors. We can uh, buy at a, um, your, a normal customer like Texas Instruments and put them in the rover. So it's depending only on the mission. If you have a short mission, like uh, saying a day on the moon, then we can put in simple hardware, don't do any air shielding, and yeah, it's really working because um, it takes time till the hardware will be damaged through the race. So on short term, it's pre uh, pretty easy for us. So I want to introduce our uh, rover, our rover, the last version, the R3 Asimov Venue. So there are six features uh, I want to present you, which are special. So the first one is the suspension lift. So imagine you have a rover and uh, there's a mold on the uh, surface and the rover is stuck in the mold because uh, the wheel um, can't rotate on the surface. Uh, it's not moving anymore, it has no grip on the surface. So the suspension lift uh, allows us to uh, rise up and move down each uh, wheel separately. So we can uh, go over a rock or uh, get a grip on a mold. The second one is the terminal management. So on the moon surface, you have nearly 125 uh, degrees on the top of, our, uh, yeah, of your object. So the solar panel uh, have 125 degrees Celsius uh, of incoming heat. And our own hardware is producing heat. So we have to get the heat outside of our rover. To uh, accomplish this, we uh, build a special uh, terminal management, which is a passive management. So um, it takes the heat. Speed it uh, down under the uh, on the downside of the rover on the bottom, 
to the uh, surface of the moon, and then it will be reflected in the space. So it's a passive array. The third one is a solar panel. So uh, the solar panel is a special one because uh, it's a tiltable solar panel. So um, it means that if you have a rover, you want to uh, look with the panel into the sun direction to get the most efficient uh, uh, energy. Uh, to do that, you uh, normally will uh, say, OK, uh, uh, use a panel, look into the direction of the sun, and stop uh, driving. So if I want to move in any direction, I have to stop with the solar panel and tilt my uh, rover and move in this direction and again uh, rotate back. Um, so we um, did a, a driver system that um, each wheel is uh, separately, so it can uh, rotate 100, uh, 360 degrees in itself. So uh, it's tiltable, so it's uh, possible to uh, get the direction of the sun, the ten uh, panel, and move in every direction we want, so at the same time. Uh, it's make it a lot of easy, a lot easier to get energy in this way. So the next one is the uh, intelligent drives. So uh, we put a lot of sensors and hardware into our drives to get a lot of information. So for example, um, if you move over, move over uh, a sand, then it can be that you're stuck in here, uh, there because uh, you, yeah, you. Uh, you put too much power into it, so it's uh, driving uh, through. And to, redu uh, to get it around this problem, you simply put in a, a sensor, which is uh, censoring the information how much uh, forces are come back from uh, the force I put out. And so I know, oh, I'm stucking or I'm in the air, so stop. Or I say, OK, I tilt down the uh, wheel to get grip on the surface. So it's a uh, most efficient way to get uh, through a surface. And next, uh, the stereo cameras. So we built in um, two cameras. At the moment, uh, they are capable to uh, capture images, videos, and 3D images uh, up to 4,000 uh, resolution. And last but not least, the seals. So uh, on the moon surface, you have a problem with regolith. Regolith is a, uh, is a 1,000 times smaller than sand on the Earth. So it can simply uh, go through the seals. It's not important how uh, thin the seals are. It's getting in. And it will destroy over time uh, your machinery, your hardware. So uh, to get around this, you normally use a uh, labyrinth system. It's uh, yeah, you build in your uh, seals array, and set uh, the regular cam in, and uh, will be uh, uh, yeah, drive out by exit point. So there's a mechanic which allows us um, to say as a regular which come in to block it. And so it have to find another way out. And uh, there's an exit point where it will flow out. So it's not uh, going deeper into the uh, mechanic. So uh, we are also doing uh, many tests with our rovers. So for example, one test was uh, uh, yeah, we want to test how it's uh, working in a cave uh, where it's really cold, where it's sand, stone, and there's uh, not much light and uh, the high pressure. So get more real uh, yeah, environment. So we got um, a test on the Alpen in a cave, in an ice cave, at 1,500 uh, meters.
So um, yeah, in this uh, test you could see um, that there yeah, it's a dark place, it's red, and we had some problems with the sand. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we get it. Uh, that's a profile of the uh, reels are not really perfect. So we use many of these tests to get out where is a uh, weak spot on a uh, yeah on the rover and improve this. So um, after that, we did another test. Um, you have to know from uh, Earth to Moon, that's uh, such a huge distance that it takes nearly 1.5 seconds that an electrical uh, signal come over there. And to get a response from it, you take an additional 1.5 seconds back. So you have a three second delay if you want to do uh, an input. So we tested it on Earth uh, with a sen simple your test area. So, as you can see, it's possible, but um, the rover was bumping in, in a lot of bottles. So, um, it's not our goal to bump into a rock or in a mold. So, we uh, thought about alternatives. So, the next step was um, autonomy. So, we thought about autonomy and we found a partner, the DLR. It's a, a government, a European government organization, which is related to space, uh, air space engineering. So we implemented with them on our rover uh, autonomy, real-time autonomy rover a system which is um, capable to move uh, around the surface without uh, need any inputs from us. So we define only a, a start point, an end point, and he tried to get uh, the ray through it. So as you can see here, um, you have on the uh, bottom right corner uh, the view of the rover. So the rover is uh, getting in from the ca two cameras, uh, the pictures generating a 3D heat map. So it is now where the uh, a rock or where the mold, and uh, it's rating the area. So it say, oh, that's really risky to drive over there. It's really good to drive over there, and it's not so far away from my uh, final point. So I move this direction. Mm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. Um, well, here see a uh, detailed view of uh, the river itself. Um, does it work? Yes. So you see a blue, uh, blue dot on the uh, upper side on the black line. That's the position of the rover. And uh, the visualization is only to uh, figure out in the test label uh, if it's working correct way. So uh, the test on this, uh, yeah, in this area was to uh, get a red ball. So it's sneaking around and look for a red ball. And it's not bumping in in any risky areas. So I want to come uh, give Wes the next topic. Hello, everyone. I'm Wes. Uh, Thomas spoke to you in English. I'll speak to you in American which I've been told I grew up as English, but uh, told it's not quite, so bear with me. One of the challenges, um, actually I want to talk to you about a lot of the challenges we have to face and the creativity that it brings to us with our designs and our solutions and uh, the kind of the out of the box thinking you have to do. And I was just want to make you aware of some of those challenges too. But one of the challenges is version control of this presentation. And so I need to come up and double check something before we get into a slide that's not there. So please come up here, Claudio.
think Thomas tried to bring it about when we talked about building. You know, that's the first phase of the mission. We have to build something. But to build that, you have to have a lot of infrastructure in place. Version control, communication, Skype. You had to deal with the eight-hour delay talking to people around the world and all the email and such. So kind of par for the course when you have 100 people worldwide in all different languages doing our work to uh, be able to keep the ver different versions of these documents. For instance, you know, this document's about one and a half gigabytes, and we've had about six versions happen during this week already. You know, been transferred around the world many times, a la Dropbox. So, one of the challenges, smooth recovery. Thank you, Claudio. So, radiation. Radiation is, is a source of inspiration and a source of pain for us. And this beautiful diagram, not ours, so I won't take credit for it, but a beautiful diagram shows you how, what an electronic circuit really looks like physically. You know, this is the array of gates that are in your cell phones. They're in this little presenter, this little baby computer right here that's just for clicking, that is everywhere. Probably not this watch, but probably a bunch of the watches out there. So everywhere, these electronics just get smaller and smaller and smaller and more power efficient and more susceptible to radiation. And to show you why, I need to show you the smallest thing in the electronics. Basic transistor. Transistor is a stoplight. You know, electrons are trying to move along. Transistor says stop. You can't go until the gate signals and lets the signal continue on. That's the basic job. Just turn it on and off, stop, stop light. That's its job, traffic control. So that works fine until you have a cosmic ray come screaming through. You know, remember the Toyota scare where the Toyotas would accelerate and blamed on cosmic rays? So cosmic rays are these little particles literally from outer space, billions of miles away, galaxy far, far away and whatnot, that are real. They come streaking through our atmosphere, they come tearing into our electronics, and when they do, they bump into the atoms and they knock electrons off, and now you've got positive ions and you've got mobile electrons. You got mobile electrons, you got electricity flowing, you have a short circuit happening in that transistor. All of a sudden, your device is not acting as a traffic stop. It's like having a traffic light go wrong, become green all the way around, and let every car collide dead center. Not the best thing you want to have happen in the middle of a mission to the moon. Well, it turns out that our electronics, our, our electronics, not just our moon electronics, our humans' electronics, are getting so power efficient so small, um, you know, they just sip electricity for days, that even at sea level, you know, right, at, right at the ground level, you know, where you have the most protection from our atmosphere that you can get, that our latest electronics are having serious problems with cosmic rays. You know, these things, these things come in, they cause short circuits left and right in our electronics. So then the issue is, this is going to happen. For other reasons we'll talk about, you have to send smaller and smaller and more power efficient electronics out into space, but they're even malfunctioning here, so what do we do about it? We make the electronics smarter, we get more creative with it. Um, we actually add democracy to a lot of the electronics. So when you memorize something, you don't memorize it just in my head. We put it in three different heads, three different RAM chips. And when you ask for the answer, you get three different answers all at once, and then they vote. Now you can take that, three is the minimum you need to vote. You could vote you know, out of five, out of seven, some kind of odd number. You can do all kinds of things, but three is the minimum you need to do a voting scheme. And you do some basic ands and ors with really big logic gates that probably don't short out when you have a little gray. So you mix old technology with the new technology and the old acts as a glue to let the old work, or let the uh, new work. So we had that triple redundancy in there. One of the interesting things that comes up is say, why don't we just add shielding? You know, we have radiation shielding in our nuclear reactors, right? And that works most of the time. So why don't we just add shielding to our satellites and to our space electronics? And to understand that, you gotta realize there's three types of cosmic rays. Not four, that's not, this pointer doesn't count. Three types. You've got the slow walking cosmic ray, You've got the fast walker, and then you've got the runner who just is already off the stage, okay? So you've got those, those kinds. Well, it turns out that slow walker is so slow that he never knocks electrons off of anything. He's not a problem. 
So no issue. We don't care about the slow walkers. The fast walkers are so fast that they never take the time to talk to those atoms as they go through. They don't actually interact. The fast walkers, due to a quirk of the momentum physics, rip right through and have no, no real effect. It's the middle ones. It's the fast it's the uh, fast walkers, I'm sorry, it's the runners who have no problems. It's the fast walkers in the middle that are the problem. So when you put up shielding, if you put up just a little bit of shielding, you block the slow ones. You also take the runners and slow them down and turn them into fast walkers. So if you put a little bit of shielding, you make your problem worse, which is kind of a weird paradox. You try to protect yourself a little bit and your problem gets worse. So if you put a lot of shielding, and by that I'm talking, you know, 10 centimeters of shielding because you want to stop all the runners, now all of a sudden your mission probably goes three times the cost. I mean, old electronics that went up had very thick electronic shields. They had air. It was sealed. It was its own little box. You know, they weigh thousands and thousands of kilos for the electronics box. It sits in, it's a vault. It's a safe with extreme shielding. These days, to have commercial companies, to have private people like myself and part-time scientists put satellites into space, we have to face the world with no shielding. We have to be creative in our electronic circuits, design them for fault tolerance. Well, the most creative I've seen so far is somebody just said, if my CPU is gonna have a problem, I'm just gonna reboot it every minute anyway. So reboot your PC every minute and you'll have no problems. So that was their solution, creative. So radiation, how big of a problem is it? How, much, how often do we have to really think about this? Well, it turns out our Earth, and again, a beautiful visualization, I won't take credit for it. Beautiful visualization shows our Earth is swimming in radiation. We actually trap these Van Allen radiation belts around the Earth where this great cosmic rays come in and they get stuck and they stick around the Earth and they start swirling around. Okay, but we're going to the moon, so is this really a problem? What about for NASA that sends things far out into space? Turns out the Earth is part of a larger system of radiation belts, super highways guided by the magnetic fields of the sun and the planets that trap these radiation and accelerate them, make life worse for the satellites swimming out there. So space is not empty. We have to deal with these facts creatively with our electronics. That's, I think that's actually really exciting. You know, it's, it's kind of a pain to sit in electronics design and drop down, you know, five copies of every chip, wire them up, but it's worth it. It's kind of, in, it's mind expanding to think, what if this fails? What if that fails at every step? It's, it's very exciting. One of the other challenges we have to deal with is plasma. That's the purple glowy stuff you see in the sci-fi movies. You know, it's in the warp reactor and Star Trek, trademark. Um, it's in this beautiful plasma chamber at a research university here. It's that glowing stuff, stuff where you rip the electrons away. You've got the, it's just this really hot soup. Uh, some people think if you get it hot enough, we get controlled fusion. That would be awesome. Turns out space is full of plasma. In fact, a lot of those cosmic rays we talk about actually came from our sun. Our sun, beautiful furnace, love it. It's certainly keeping things warm here today. Um, our sun throws off, you know, an earth of plasma all the time. I mean, it burns the, burns the hydrogen. Its, it's net result is this plasma being yanked off into space. You know, coronal mass ejections, they cause nice, um, nice uh, lights in the sky, but they also give us um, they also give us great pains for electronics. So plasma, moving electric, moving positive and negatives, sweeping it towards us from the sun. They hit our magnetic field. We're blessed with a glorious magnetic field that keeps these things from coming down and boiling us all alive. If you've never given thanks to a magnetic field, now is the time to think about it. All right, it really helps us. But the trouble is, it helps us here because out there, you take those moving electric charges, trap the magnetic field. Now you have a moving electric charge, you have current. Where you have current, you have voltage. That means space is not zero volts for electronics, okay? 
Zero volts, zero volts. Thankfully, zero volts. I'm not getting shocked. Space is not zero volts. Which means you build a satellite, a, a spaceship, a, a rover, anything that sits out there near the plasma. And again, not my picture, but many thanks to the researchers who put it up there for us to use. Your battery that you're sitting up there, you might think you're, you know, we build our systems to have zero ground. That's not zero relative to space, which means your thing is sitting there pulling in, pulling in these particles. It's building up static electricity. You know, that clingy effect where you rip the shrink wrap off of something. That sticky thing that builds up on your feet as you trump across. I'll wait to shock Claudio here in a minute. But, you know, you build up that charge on you. That's what's happening to your satellite, and it happens because you have a battery because you're trying to do your mission. So you have to accept this is going to happen. Now what happens, as long as everything builds up, like you come across the carpet, if I never touch that table, I have no spark, right? So as long as I don't touch anything, I'm good. But as soon as I have a difference, there's a problem. You know, when I touch that table, it's zero. I'm not, there's a spark. So if you imagine a satellite that's got a nice tubular body and a big wings out here for the panels, then you say, what happens if those panels get more charged than the body? You'll get a spark between them. When that spark happens, it damages things. You know, that spark comes into a solar panel, sparks in, it's gonna crack that solar panel, it's gonna damage it, now that ship has a little bit less power. Um, repeat, and it just goes on and on. In fact, those sparks kill 55% of the satellites. They are responsible for most of the satellite failures, not radiation. Radi so radiation's coming up, but these sparks are actually what does us in. So it's our, it's our normal negative grounding system, our normal electronics makes it worse, and the fact that we use a lot of lightweight plastics to build things, to keep the mass down, makes it worse as well because now you have a chance for buildup, so you have to add lots of little wires to keep all the charge the same everywhere across the whole craft. So it would be like me wearing you know, a metal suit, like a big screen, just to make sure it all stays equal so I don't get shocked anywhere. Now, not only do you have to design interestingly there, there are some researchers out there who have said, let's just accept this. Our space is not empty, it's full of plasma, we swim in it. There's a little different, it's a different voltage closer to the Earth than it is a little higher. Might be one microvolt difference per meter, but it is different. And with difference comes opportunity. And so there are researchers out there saying, what if I use different batteries and I charge my craft on purpose from the plasma they swim in? And if I do that, now I can get them to formation fly. They will stay their desired distance away from each other. So accept the fact you're swimming in it instead of fighting it, and all of a sudden you have new opportunities for smaller, lighter craft. And I find that really exciting, sort of mind expanding, to think there are these problems, but we need to think about it differently and it becomes an opportunity for us for a lighter, cost, lighter cheaper mission. Now, Next item I want to talk about is data archiving. Believe it or not, it's a big issue for us for all space missions. And you'll be pleased to know this one's going to be in Portuguese from Claudio. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, então, uh, eu vou falar para vocês um pouco da importância de armazenamento de dados de, nesse tipo de, de missões uh, para fora do, do nosso planeta Terra. Uh, Acho que todo mundo deve conhecer a sonda Pioneer. Ela foi lançada pela NASA em 1972 e ela continua operacional até hoje. E a missão dela era, é, atualmente, e continua rodando, é sair o mais longe do espaço sideral descobrindo coisas que a gente nunca viu antes. É a missão mais ousada é, que já foi feita pelo homem. E foi lançada em 1972, então 40, mais de 40 anos funcionando. É, essa sonda, é, ela basicamente tem uma, ante, uma antena é, direcionada para o nosso planeta, recebendo dados, enviando dados de telemetria. É, ela tem 
dois é, reatores nucleares, dois geradores de nucleares para gerar energia para o sistema. E é, ela tem um circuito aqui no meio com sensores é, para é, pegar é, dados do, do ambiente e mandar para a Terra para a gente saber o que está acontecendo lá. É, essa sonda, é, qualquer objeto que tu envia para fora do espaço e que não vai orbitar um outro planeta, é, ele deveria, ele, ele deve é, andar na uma velocidade constante, uma velocidade muito alta, muito alta mesmo, quilômetros por segundo. É, e, é, só que é, a gente encontrou um problema, na verdade os cientistas da NASA. É, depois, é, ela, não, ela deveria estar é, constantemente a é, uma velocidade, certa velocidade, só que depois de um, algum tempo, eles, opa, peraí, é, a sonda ela está diminuindo a velocidade e é, eles não sabem por quê. E depois, isso depois de, de 26 anos é, de, de, de missão em 1998, é, eles conseguiram perceber pela telemetria que é uma pequena taxa, taxa muito pequena é, de desaceleração. É, essa taxa era tão pequena que não podia ser percebida pela telemetria. Então, depois de 26 anos, eles perceberam que tinha um, a velocidade tinha diminuído um pouquinho. É, e isso não deveria acontecer. É, inicialmente, é, isso a, 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 acabou acarretando a sociedade toda, é, acadêmica, físicos, astrônomos, engenheiros, a, em busca de, dessa, dessa explicação, por que estava tava freando. Então, uh, engenheiros no início eles acharam que podia ser algum problema no sistema de tracking que envia ondas, uh, os efeitos Doppler, usa, envia ondas da Terra para a sonda e da sonda para a Terra e essas ondas uh, tu, tu, conhece, tu consegue saber uh, a, a, o movimento do objeto, aonde ele está indo, tu tem a distância e quanto tempo esse, esse sinal demorou para ir e voltar. Uh, mas não era o não era problema aí. Então, analisando os dados, Uh, dados recentes de 10 anos de, de missão, eles encontraram uma relação pequena um, entre o decaimento do, do plutônio, do, do reator nuclear, do, do gerador nuclear e uh, a taxa em que estava uh, desacelerando. Uh, então eles, eles tentaram uh, relacionar, explicar, fazer com que uh, faz, fizesse sentido chegar a uma conclusão de que a radiação Uh, gerada pelo, o, pelo gerador nuclear estava afetando o sistema, uh, os circuitos e, e a operação na máquina. Uh, eles chegaram à conclusão de que essa radiação era tão uh, pequena uh, que não, não afetaria o sistema, era um décimo do que afetaria o sistema, então tinha alguma outra coisa. E eles não, não sabiam, analisando os dados, muito, 15 anos analisando os dados, e, uh, Hoje, uh, eles chegaram a uma conclusão, a gente precisa de mais dados. Só que, quando a gente precisa de mais dados, uh, em missões de longo, longa duração, a gente tem um problema, que é a tecnologia de armazenamento. Uh, 40 anos atrás, a tecnologia de armazenamento de dados era totalmente diferente do que é hoje. Uh, a gente vai avançando nos anos e a tecnologia vai mudando, vai mudando, graças a Deus, né? Então, é, eles tiveram muitos problemas para encontrar é, esse, o que isso tinha sido arquivado. É, eles tiveram que usar tecnologias antigas para poder ler esses, esse tipo de armazenamento. É, por causa do armazenamento e do tempo, é, alguns dados tinham sido corrompidos. Eles tiveram que é, trabalhar algoritmos para recuperar os dados, para ler setor por setor, pix, bit, byte por byte e recuperar esses dados. Depois desse árduo trabalho, provavelmente alguns meses ou até anos, eh, eles conseguiram eh, pegar todos os dados, eles conseguiram dados de 23 anos de completos da missão, da missão 23 anos completos da missão, dados. Eh, eles, então, ah, legal, agora nós temos mais dados para eh, tentar analisar. Porque antes eles estavam analisando dados que eles tinham no, acesso no sistema atual, que tinha mudado a tecnologia, acessava pelos computadores. Então, depois de ter esses dados, é, trabalhando em cima, eles encontraram é, o, a causa. Era o, era o reator nuclear. 
eram os geradores nucleares que geravam eletricidade. Só que todo mundo pensa, a radiação é uma das piores coisas que tem para a eletrônica, o Wesley falou agora há pouco, né? É, só que não era radiação, era o calor gerado, não a radiação gerada, mas o calor gerado, é, irradiava calor do, é, do gerador nuclear e um pouco também dos circuitos no, dentro do no núcleo do, da sonda, porque a eletricidade passa pelos cabos e gera, é, gera temperatura. Então, eles, intenta, eles encontraram essa relação da, da temperatura com o desaceleramento da, da sonda. Só, só que essa, essa, essa temperatura, uh, essa temperatura para explicar para vocês por que, que ela desacelera o, o, a sonda, uh, tem, eles chamam de força, uh, uh, força uh, ter, uh, termo, uh, termorredutora. Ou seja, para explicar mais ou menos para vocês, dar um exemplo prático. Uh, o carro de vocês que tem, uh, as, uh, quando tu liga os faróis, gera um calor na, na lâmpada. E essa lâmpada, ela, ela, o calor gerado ali, ele, ele freia um pouco o teu carro. Só que a gente não percebe. Isso é uma, é, é, é a energia é tão pequena, tão pequena. É a mesma, é, é a mesma, essa energia, é a me, é, é, essa força, é a mesma força que está afetando a sonda no, lá no espaço. Só que ela, é, é, essa força está afetando o sistema em não em um, algum dia ela vai parar então é, a importância de ter dados de, de, de uh, encontrar algum jeito de manter esses dados uh, uh, o acesso a esses dados e como gerenciar as tecnologias que vão passando para os próximos anos que uh, por causa do calor gerado na frente da sonda uh, 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 se, se o calor fosse assimétrico ele ele te, não teria problema, teria duas forças para os dois lados da sonda, mas o calor era gerado só na frente. Então, a força gerada pelo calor, uh, dessa força termorredutora, fazia com que, o, faz com que, hoje em dia, ela esteja desacelerando. Então, é muito importante manter dados para poder analisar e para poder conseguir respostas de coisas que eles não, nunca pensaram que pudesse acontecer. Essa energia termorredutora não se conhecia até ontem, por causa de feitos assim que a gente consegue fazer ciência e consegue descobrir mais coisas. E essa é a importância de manter dados. Agora eu vou voltar para o Wesley, eu fiquei bastante tempo falando. O Wesley vai, vai continuar a apresentação. Obrigado. Claudio, that sounded so nice. I wish I understood it. <laughs> Someday, right? You'll keep teaching me, right? Some of the other things. That some of the other things. I'm still getting used to that. Do you guys are used to that? Or that's a constraint you've had to deal with. This is the major constraint that governs all of our all of our actions in any space mission. This is a the rocket equation. This says how fast you can go depends on oh, depends on how good your engine is and on this nice exponential cost function of the fuel. It means if you want to put just a little bit more in the outer space, you've got to pay a lot more in fuel. Exponentially more. It's terrible. There we go. For those who want a more detailed explanation, I refer you to NASA. They have some nice reading material up there on the internet. They'll tell you all kinds of great things. The key is they just rephrase this to talk about the fuel economy. That's at ISP. That's one of my favorite topics to talk about is the fuel economy of various rocket technologies. That the fuel economy makes a difference, but once you have a fixed fuel, fixed, fixed um, rocket that you're going to buy, like the Nepper, then it all comes down to that big ratio and a nice exponential cost function. In fact, some people looked at space mission costs through the years, and they say there's a sweet spot where if you want to put just a little more in space, it's going to cost you a lot more propellant, and it's going to cost you a lot more mission cost. And so everything we do has to be based on these numbers. We can't wish list, hey, I'd like, I'd like 50 different sensors on my spacecraft. Can we do with 10? Not only for the power, but for the weight. Hey, I want a lot of shielding on my spacecraft. Okay, double the money we need. 
but it's only an extra kilo. Double the money, it's got to go to the moon, and it's exponential. That's how that works. There's no way around this law of physics. So, like um, Thomas had talked about, we have these intelligent drives on our rover. Just little motors sitting down there on the wheels, right? But because the sensors and the little computer chips are built right into the drives, we don't need a separate computer for that. We save like a kilogram of weight. That means we've saved like a million dollars in mission cost just in putting gas in the tank on the rocket and building a bigger rocket to hold a bigger tank. Little things like that, those little ideas, it might just seem like a little feather, really, really, really add up. Every little scrap of creativity adds up on these missions, especially when you're not a government paying for it. Every little idea you have staying late at night, staying up at night, makes a difference in these things. One that's near and dear to my heart, as Thomas mentioned, I'm launching a small satellite. So a small satellite has its own constraints. It only has about one watt of power. You know, so probably less power than I get out of this battery at any given time. Um, and that's when it's in full sunlight, when everything's perfect. If it just cocked itself a little to the side, things go down. Well, a satellite needs to know which way it's pointing. So you need, you need all the little sensor chips to tell which way you're pointing. But those things are noisy. Remember, they're being hit with radiation. They're being reset all the time. It's a bumpy, bumpy, bumpy signal that's really kind of miserable to look at. Hard to tell which way you're going if your speedometer is doing this all the time, right? So you've got to put a little computer chip on there to smooth it out intelligently. Well, you do all that, and you bake it down, and you get it down to the size of about, I'm going to totally screw this up, about a real coin, about a euro coin, uh, or an American quarter. Funny, they're all about the same size. Um, and you get this incredibly complicated piece of equipment here, which is a fabulous piece of equipment, but it's still 0.25. It's still a quarter watt. And remember, this is space. We don't do one thing in space. You've got to do at least two to have a little bit of backup. So half the power budget on that little satellite is dedicated to finding out where it's pointing, which means you can't always know where you're pointing. You have to find out where you're pointing and then turn that off and then go do something else and then turn that off and come back out and say, well, where am I pointing now? You gotta be creative with how you do that because you can't have everything you want all the time in space because of all these constraints, but it's mind expanding. You know, it sounds frustrating and it can be, from an engineering, from a pure theoretical standpoint, I want this. I should be able to have this. It's theoretically possible. Real world says, no, you can't. And therein lies the fun, I think. That's what those, those problem solving. There's never been one for a Rubik's Cube, but I'm one for solving this kind of problem. This one was a fun problem. And it's the last of our problems we're going to talk about. But we figured we should finish on the moon, right? So regolith, uh, lunar soil. That I, I don't want to say lunar dirt. It's so much more fun to say regolith. Can I get a regolith? Regolith? Regolith. It's so much more fun to say. So regolith is this little teeny tiny grain. They're sharp. They're brittle. They'll dig into everything. And so the astronauts, while they walked on the moon, you know, they're stomping along and the regolith dust is coming up, OK? Their, air, their suits are airtight. They lived through that process. No air left their suits. Think how small air is, right? Regolith got into their suits. No air could get out of those suits, but regolith got in. These little teeny particles, they dig in, and then you move the suit, and that just moves them forward. They ratchet themselves forward, and they get into everything. They dig into seals, they'll get into motors. You have to accept they will get everywhere. You could imagine the problem this would be if it actually got certain bad places in the suit, because you cannot wipe your eyes in a space suit. Regolith, it turns out, is fascinating dirt. This is not normal dirt. Regolith is about half oxygen. That's right. It's got a lot of metals in it, and it's got oxygen, and it's got a few other things like silicon. So it is sand, silicon and oxygen, and it is rust, aluminum rust, it is iron rust, magnesium rust, it is rust and sand and oxygen. And that's fascinating. 
That's fascinating. In fact, the big talks are what do you do with this regolith? It's a problem, but it's a resource. Metal blocks radiation. So what could you do if you could take the regolith and build a dome? You could protect yourself from the radiation just by using the dirt that's there. Now, interestingly enough, when those cosmic rays, all those plasma things coming in, what's the sun made out of? Hydrogen. What's the plasma coming from the sun? Hydrogen. Hydrogen hits this regolith, it bonds with the oxygen, you're left with H2O, water. So as long as that stays in a cool place where you don't heat it up too much, it doesn't leave, and that's why they're finding water on the moon. So as soon as you've got water on the moon buried into this dust, now that's a game changer. You can start to, you can start to build things with it, you can start to do 3D printing of regolith, and that's actually being discussed. Take the water out of the regolith, use it to moisten it, make a concrete out of the regolith itself, and 3D print that. Uh, I mean, amazing things are possible with this thing that's otherwise dangerous and that we would be trying to fight. But instead, we try to find ways to embrace as humanity. Now, for us, as part-time scientists, it, it, it really drastically impacts our mission. Not only the seals, but the fact is, it's metal. So, if I try to send a radio signal through these chairs, it'll probably get there because these chairs are plastic. If I try to send it through the woods, the forest, probably get there. Um, it's not very dense. I try to send it through a sheet of iron. Done. Not going anywhere. Okay? All that metal stops those radio signals. Which means if our rover goes behind a rock, all of a sudden it loses communication because it can't communicate through even a little bit of rock. It's like having you know, all kinds of reflectors and signal noise. In fact, we've had to do calculations like this to show if the lander lands where it's nice and bright green, where is it safe for the rover to drive before it loses, it can't hear what's going on in the lander, it can't hear us ground control. Um, incidentally, that's something like, um, like 100 trillion math computations and uh, NVIDIA has helped us out do those on their, they're good for more than video games. Now, last thing about regolith, we talked about it's good, and it's bad, it's also good. I love this part of our design. I love it, I love it. We don't talk enough about it, Thomas. So, you've got that sun beating down on your rover, okay? It's just baking it, 125 degrees on top. You've got to do something with all that infrared heat that you're building up, right? Well, what's the ground underneath you? It's reflective. Well, normally you think that's a problem. You'd radiate the heat down to the ground and just come back up. No. Our rover has got that gold chest plate runs down it. That chest plate is specially shaped. It takes that infrared heat, puts it out on the ground at an angle. So it goes out at an angle and it bounces up past the wings of Asimov out into space. So we've turned that problem as a reflector. We've turned it into an asset by just clever design to get rid of our heat and to stay stable. So that's part of why our rover has the shape it does. And also why we have to be power constrained. We can't make its wings any bigger, its solar panel any bigger, or we can't reflect our heat. We'd start to soak it back up. So we have to stay within those tight power constraints because it's all interconnected. And I'd love that part of space science and the creativity of having solving one problem but it breaks another and you've got to keep going. But I can't keep going. I'm going to turn this over to Thomas. So, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Um, next, next, we want to uh, thank our uh, our, our partners. So, in the last um, couple of years, we're working um, with the DLR. It's a government. Uh, it's a yeah. It's a space agency in Germany. So, it's um, taking. A lot of uh, engineers uh, sitting around and say, hmm, you want to make a mission? Okay, we can validate the information behind it. We can help you uh, to think about it. And you know, so they helped us a lot. And additionally, um, there's a, a technical university in um, Berlin. So they helped us a lot with um, data of the Apollo missions. So we got uh, Informations of the uh, lunar surface, of the moon surface, um, to calculate uh, for um, simulations. So uh, we have simulations where you can uh, test um, 
how much energy you take um, to get over a point to another one. So um, to get these calculations uh, are running, you need a lot of data, and we got it from the two billion. So there's also um, the two um, Hamburg Harburg. It's a technical university um, in Hamburg, and uh, we're working. Uh, we're working together with them to um, yeah, build up uh, PCBs and uh, make low-level programming like FPGA. Um, yeah. So this is the special free one we want to thank. Um, so finally, if the next slide will come, <laughs> it's a lot of technical issues today. Oh yeah, it's loading. So yeah, the last uh, slide I can t um, say it's a QA. So um, if you have some questions, you can. Uh, is there uh, short ones? You can uh, ask us now. So because of the um, language issue, um, we will try to get it in English. If it's uh, Portuguese, uh, we try to uh, translate it. And if it's a more uh, deep uh, questions, then uh, yeah, you can come over to the boot camp over there on the moon. So uh, right on the side, so, uh, we have a boot camp where we are working on, uh, on the rovers and PCB. And yeah, you can talk with us. So yeah. Please stand up and come over here. And are there any questions? About the radiation stuff that you said, do you think that these optical devices and processors that are going to be built now will help you somehow to to avoid this this problem? Okay. I, I have the same question about the radiation too. Uh, is there any other way, like a electronic, as optical for for instance, or electronic devices that you can build? differently, like a, a way to make a shield of electronic to avoid this issue of, of radiation. Hello? Hello? I want to answer this. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. How is this? Any better? Okay. So optical processors Optical processors would probably help us quite a bit, but they're not on our radar. The technology is too far out for our deadline, so we probably will not be able to use it. Also, you have to be able to consider the compute density on the optical processors and the fact that a lot of that optical equipment still has conversion to electrical signals in it. So until we can get it to maybe, you know, I'm guessing personally about 75 to 85% optical, for the, for the mission critical logic, then we're okay. But then you still have to consider the actuators. You know, how do you, how do you get, say, a motor control circuit to be optical? You know, um, until we can do that, get like a PID loop for motor control and optical, there's gonna be a problem. I don't, I'm afraid our mission timeline doesn't let us launch with that technology. Now, as far as the other one about radiation, is there a way to shield Again, probably not on our particular mission, but there has been some research I've been reading about on the internet. Um, companies are talking about using, you know, strong magnetic fields and strong um, hyper fields around craft to deflect a lot of the radiation. The trouble comes in if you try to slow it down. Slowing it down causes you to bring those fast ones that don't really interact down to a dangerous speed. But if you can deflect them past, now you can deflect most of that around. So um, I think that's a technology that's being strongly considered for like a, like a Mars mission, is using a really strong magnetic field and actually seeding that with your own plasma and maintaining sort of a plasma shield. That's real sci-fi things, but it is being discussed for Mars missions.
É, você falou da, da Pioneer, né? É, a Voyager 1 e a Voyager 2 tiveram o mesmo, tiveram mesmo problema, as duas, com, com a redução do termo de, de, de temperatura? E... There are regolith in Mars 2 or not? Uh, Para o problema de, da, da, da desaceleração, a Pioneer 10 e a Pioneer 11 estão, estão tendo o mesmo problema. A Pioneer 11 e a 10 elas, elas foram lançadas com uma diferença de dois anos, mais ou menos, entre uma e outra. E uh, a segunda ela tem um pouco mais de tecnologia, mas é basicamente a mesma tecnologia. Uh, e muito legal a tua pergunta porque uh, isso fez com que isso, uh, essa descoberta que eles tiveram uh, dessa energia termorredutora que uh, inicialmente era meio teórica e isso fez uh, provar e, e hoje em dia eles têm, eles têm esse conhecimento para não cometer o mesmo erro nas próximas missões. O jeito que tu uh, joga o teu calor para fora de uma sonda, uh, é importante tu uh, saber o jeito que tu joga o calor para fora. Tu não pode só jogar o calor para fora. De, ah, tem dissipadores, legal, eu não, eu não posso aquecer meu sistema, mas tu não pode jogar de qualquer jeito. Eles estavam por causa da antena, por causa do, da engenharia, né? a antena era uma parabólica e ficava uh, fica para a Terra e eles estão recebendo sinais. Eles, não, é meio difícil tu fazer uma engenharia para botar o calor para o lado da antena, tu vai ter problemas com comunicação. Mas nas próximas designs, né, eles vão provavelmente pensar mais em... Porque se aquele calor uh, não fosse só para um lado e fosse para o lado da antena também, uh, simetricamente, uh, as forças uh, termorredutoras para lá e para cá, os vetores, iam se anular e não ia ter esse problema de de desaceleração. Então, é uma coisa que eles aprenderam e a gente, é, é, através disso, a gente vê a importância de é, armazenar os dados e, e como no, no, futuramente o, a, o, a, a, os dados, o armazenamento de dados vai mudar as tecnologias, provavelmente vão, e com, mas como a gente mantém as missões futuras, ou as que estão rodando hoje em dia, como é que a gente mantém a disponibilidade desses dados para que eu possa ler e, e que, tenha que sejam confiáveis os dados, que não acabe corrompendo. Então, é, é, isso é o, o grande problema. Esse é o grande desafio que a gente apresentou aqui, vários desafios, esse é um, um dos grandes desafios. Muito obrigado. Uh, hi, hi. About the uh, spacecraft that will carry the, the rover, it wasn't clear, clear for me if you guys not listening. It's not loud enough. Uh, it's not loud enough. <laughs> About the spacecraft that will carry the rover, you guys are going to project it or, or not? Your brain or something? Are, are, are we projecting the lander? Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, we're creating uh, a lander by, uh, in cooperation with uh, some other uh, partners. Um, but it's still in progress, so we are started at um, here end of the last year with it. So, uh, but we will outsource a lot of the stuff because um, it's a really, really huge problem. So you have a lot of technology in there, and you have to fit with uh, governmental rules. So there are a lot of uh, specs from outside you have to fit in because there are a lot of interfaces to the carrier itself. So um, to fit it, uh, we outsource it to an uh, institution like uh, DLR who are uh, yeah, capable to know which, uh, where are the problems, what we have to consider. And some other parts like uh, the structure of the uh, lander, uh, what uh, have to be in the hardware, wiring and so on, we will uh, be a part of it. I would like to add that we did have to read the user manual for the Russian Nepper ICBM rocket in order to do so, and it was really cool. Uh, hi, uh, I, I would like to know more about uh, suspension lift because since weight is a really, really issue that matters in this kind of mission, it looks like that it's a lot of added weight that it might, I do not know how did you guys find on this solution, but it might have other solutions to the problem in which the lift, the suspension lift would be useful. So I would like to know 
how did you guys project the suspension lift and uh, why did you choose a suspension lift? Oh, a lot of questions. Um, so let me start and then rest. Um, so first, um, we choose the active uh, suspension lift system. So um, yeah, it's a uh, in a passive, like uh, you get a, um, a force from the ground and it's automatically uh, get up and down again, like on a uh, yeah on a car. If you uh, drive over a car on a uh, road, it will uh, automatically get through the mower and up. Um, so there are also active systems, um, yeah, like on uh, some rare cars, <laughs> uh, where you can say, okay, I want to lift up and down each uh, wheel. So. Yeah, that's are the two systems. Why we choose it? Um, because of the uh, high risk to stuck somewhere. It's, it's really a, ris a really, really huge risk to uh, stuck in a mill or on a rock or... Uh, yeah, it's also a, ba a problem with the energy. So if you have uh, the possibility to uh, lift up or lift down uh, the wheel, you have a better energy use because you can uh, press the wheel on the ground. So it's much easier. I was just going to comment about the same thing. Part of the trade-off is what's your acceptable level of risk. So we could have done like like uh, NASA does a lot of six-wheeled rovers, you know, the rocker bogey system, and we felt we felt with our rover so low to the ground again to keep the mass small and the mission cost down that we did need a way to step over the small rocks that would be on there, and we thought that the rocker bogey system was more mass than the suspension lift. Although curiously. Wasn't there a problem with the springs with the suspension lift when we first started playing with that? Well, I've heard this story secondhand because I wasn't in Berlin at the time. But the springs originally sized were sized for the moon's gravity. And so we build Asimov here and try to show him on the Earth and he just slumps way down. So, you know, for demonstration, he, we have to put in, you know, stiffer springs on Earth and remember to take them out before we're to the moon or he'll push himself off. Good night. Uh, NASA has here. NASA has had a great deal to land in sea, uh, probes on Mars. Sometimes they use balloons. Sometimes uh, sky lift, and uh, sometimes they they fail. But do you plan how to land the the, the rover or the moon? Okay. <laughs> I'll take my best shot. I'm not, I'm not on the lander team. I'm a fan of the lander team. Okay? But it comes down to, um, it comes down to, it's a powered landing. So you're, you're screaming through orbit at, what is it, I think uh, five kilometers a second. Lower, low um, lunar orbit, about 100 kilometers up. And you're coming in at the far horizon, that's your landing spot. And you've got a couple seconds to pick, that's your landing spot. And then you've got, uh, you've got one main engine on the lander. And so you're horizontal, and you've got to hit that engine several times until you drop to suborbital speeds, and then you plummet. And then you brake, brake, brake through a series of controlled brakes until you drop most of your horizontal speed, orient, and then it's just a matter of keeping cameras at the ground and laid LIDAR, laser, for working at the ground and doing very controlled pulses and uh, to bring yourself down. Most of it, I think, of our flight profile is, um, you know, we can tolerate, I think it's several meters straight of a drop. So the idea is to get close to the lunar surface, bring the velocity to zero, and then finish the drop, as opposed to trying to come up with a, uh, you know, achieve zero velocity exactly at the lunar surface. So. The lander is the same vehicle that takes us from Earth orbit. So we ride up in that ICBM, we break loose, we turn around, and then we fire up our engines. That gets us out of Earth orbit. We start spiraling out to the moon. I don't think I'm giving away any secrets or trajectory. So we spiral our way out to the moon, and then we achieve lunar orbit, and then we use the remaining fuel in those braking burns. Uh, e sobre a questão de para usar um paraquedas ou qualquer outro tipo de coisa para parar, para ajudar a, a parar, uh, não funciona na Lua porque não tem atmosfera na Lua. Então...
Yeah, sorry guys, but we have to stop here. The time is over. So, uh, yeah, you can over there so we can uh, talk with you and answer the questions in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much.